I'm evaluating a place <clears throat> right now and everything on the street has sold 200 grand under assessed. And I'm also doing another evaluation in another area where everything on the street is selling 200 grand over assessed. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. back everybody to another episode of the tom story show steve is back from the most magical place on earth we're going to talk about how much money he spent and if it was worth it if you're watching us on youtube and you have not already make sure to subscribe join our growing community we are well over four thousand subscribers now which is really cool to continue to see the community grow if you watch this episode and you enjoy it hit us up with a like as well and the audio listeners well i hope you're having a wonderful day steve you finally did it. You broke. You went to Disney. <laughs> if, I know all sorts you, of money. Steve, can I just say there are so many people I've met in the real world that are like, I've told them Steve's away. He's in Disney. And they're like, oh, my God, he actually did it. So oh, yeah. was it worth it? Did the kids have fun? Uh, and I think the most important question is how much money did you spend? Is it worth it? It's, it was definitely an amazing time. It was okay. definitely fantastic. Um, we really enjoyed it. My wife says she could uh, have done another two or three or four days in the park. Wow. Uh, we did five days in the park, and trust me, that was plenty. Um, it was an experience. I mean, Disney, The um, what Disney does, the operation that they have going on is unbelievable. And I was shocked to find out, like last time I was there was probably 15 years ago. And um, you could walk up and you could buy tickets and get into the park. You can't right. do that anymore. Well, how does it work now? It's sold out. Oh, you have to just book in advance. and You have to book in advance. You have to reserve which of the two parks you're going to at what time. Like, and are you it's, using it's an app? high demand. It's, oh, you're, yeah. Your, your you're like picking your time. rides yeah. through an yeah. app in advance at certain times so you're not waiting in line. Is that how it works now? Ideally, until it gets super busy like it was it was a learning experience it was gr like there was nothing negative about the experience a couple of the wacko protesters outside of disney were a little oh really what were they pro what were they? Uh, maybe we shouldn't talk about what they're uh, they were protesting exactly what you think they were protesting right. okay home story and um but like over the deep end crazy people yelling at children walking into the park but there was like two guys doing that with loudspeakers it was annoying um, but the rest of the whole thing was absolutely stellar and no Tom story. I did not break the bank, but I did not, um, I didn't hold back either. Okay. So let's, let's walk through this because there are people thinking about taking their kids to Disney. And by the way, I promise we'll get to real estate in this episode. Maybe flights staying in the park in one of the hotels on the park. I'm guessing. No. 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 no, no, no. We're okay. at the Howard Johnson across the street. I am not. So I we did the math on that. Okay. To stay in the Disneyland Hotel versus the Howard Johnson across the street, $4,000 difference. Wow. Okay. So guess where Steve stayed? <laughs> across we're the street. We're at the Hojo. Yeah, we're at the Hojo. The kids were walking, were walking over there every day. It was an eight-minute walk to the park every morning and well okay, worth $4,000. So, that's, that's not so bad. Okay, so all in, you were there for what, five days, you said? Uh, seven nights, five days in the park. Wow. Okay. And the other days were just travel days. Is that? Yeah. Sunday to okay. Sunday, basically. Right. Yeah. You take okay. one day off in the pool and all that sort of stuff. So there's four of you total, uh, three children and one adult, your wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and what did it, what did it cost? What was a week at Disney? And by the way, you went to Disney land. That's where the people from the West Coast go, right? Not work. West Coasters go to Disneyland. So there's two parks, Disneyland and California Adventure um, on the same property. I'm okay. so old that the first time I ever went to Disneyland, California Adventure was a parking lot. Hmm. Um, so I put this out on the channel, Tom Story, so far 183 votes. Uh, and the ranges were anywhere from under $5,000 to over $20,000. Tom Story, what do you think this trip should have cost? In all, Canadian all dollars, food, flights, like everything, things so you bought did, at the park, everything. Yeah, we did our calculation. It included everything. It included parking at the airport, okay. 
because this is the thing, right? People do their vacation. Oh, I, I only spent two thousand dollars to go on yeah, that vacation. Yeah. I bought it on points, and then you're like, wait a minute. So uh, exchange. Okay, so Canadian kids spending money. Everything. I'm gonna say, if I had to guess, about seven thousand dollars Canadian flights, hotel, in the park, everything. Sorry, you said seven thousand dollars. That's what my guess would be. Oh, okay. Well, you Am are I way off to lunch, Tom Story. Is that low? Or that can't be low. Is that low? It's more than double that. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I we cranked we cranked Wait. out all the numbers. And you didn't even stay in the park. If you stayed in the park, it's a twenty grand trip. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Oh yeah. No, no, no. Okay, so this is everything. This is flight. So you would have got tickets to the park. Okay. And hotel. Or tickets to the park and flights for what you just offered. Wow. And maybe you could sleep in the bus. So it was a fifteen it was a fifteen thousand dollar trip for seven days. It was after exchange, everything included, calculated properly, fifteen thousand four hundred and thirty six dollars. You got it down to the how many cents? I'm curious. Uh, I I left that part out. Okay, it was a little too much. But on our channel, wow, I was way percent, off. Fifteen percent of people thought it would be less, or it should be less than five thousand dollars. Thirty-seven percent said uh, five to ten. Okay. Then thirty-one percent said ten to fifteen. Eleven percent, fifteen to twenty. So I mean, you're right on the border with forty-two percent of the people. And then six percent of the people said more than twenty thousand dollars. And if we would have stayed in the park, it would have been more than twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so fifteen grand. You got kids that are at an age that they can appreciate what they went to now. Looking back on this now, is that fifteen grand well spent? Are you happy you did it? Were you happy you didn't just use that to pay to pay down a lump sum on your mortgage? I'm you know, very happy. It? I'm very happy we did it. Okay. I also lump summed on my mortgage. I would not recommend someone. And this is the difference in my mortgage. I think I would not recommend someone does this every single year, which I have friends that do do it every single year. Now, I don't think you go as over the top as we did, right? Like, if you go every single year, are you sure. coming home with a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar realistic lightsaber? Probably not. Like, <laughs> that was for you, right? Yeah. No, my 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 um, youngest daughter picked out the most awesome real life lightsaber and they like she had like all her christmas money everything and she okay. was like that's what i'm getting but it was it was legitimately it was like 200 and something dollars after tax sure so um you know you're not going to do that every single time so could you do this trip for under 10 grand a hundred percent you can but if you think you're like tickets to the park for a family of four for one day is a thousand dollars wow did so, you book this through? It's all through Disney. Is there like an organization that will book it all for you? Was it? A, it was all a package, or you had to book things separately to keep the cost reasonable. Uh, we booked through a Disney specialist travel agent. Okay. Um, the the park and hotel, and it was actually really cool, cool because they actually walk you through like how to use the app, which you have to know. It was, right. It was it was pretty cool, but no, it wasn't like direct to Disney. Now I'm curious. Uh, when I think about Disney, I think about like, I went to Disney on my 10th birthday. I remember waking up and being like, oh my God, we're going to Disney. And, and I think of Disney as like a child thing. Like my little guy, he watches Disney movies. You know, it's like a big part of it. That's how they get hooked in. That's how they get them. And then by the way, Disney's genius, by the way, because they bought Marvel. So then they've got the kids till they're like 10 on the kids movies. And mm -hmm. now they've got them from like 10 to <laughs> could be like 45. And they've the, got me because of the Star Wars world. And now. then they've yeah. got you like they've got every section, right? Like it, it works mm -hmm. really well. But Disney, when you we think about it, we think about like you take your kids to Disney. That's the fact that you're that's where the reason why you're going there. Uh -huh. Is there any just like adults strolling around on their own? Oh, Is it, it was so bad. Really? So we're we're waiting in line. I've got a six and a nine year old mm -hmm. girls, and we're waiting in line to meet Elsa and Anna, the princesses. And then there's another mystery princess thing where it's like uh, it ended up being like Cinderella and Snow White, whatever. <laughs> there's a mystery princess. <laughs> like it's behind the door, so yeah, you don't okay. know which which okay. character is going to be back there. All right. Um. And unfortunately, 
so these are like half hour lineups to or 45 minute lineups. So Anna and Elsa was an hour to meet wow. Anna and Elsa for two minutes. Every so third group in line was adults without children waiting to meet princesses. What the <laughs> hell? So hey like that's everyone's one got, thing. Everyone's got their own things that makes them happy. But you know, you're we, making all of these children wait. Like they could be in and out of there in 15 minutes, but no, right. this like it, to meet the mystery princess who's behind the door people, mm -hmm. there was a 55 year old couple just ahead of us with their autograph book out. And I'm like, are you really getting this fake 18 year old Snow White to autograph your, like this is for. Oh, you're for getting autographs from them? Is that the, oh, that's what happens? No, I figured it would just pit be pictures these, these days. Autograph books were accounted for in the fifteen thousand four hundred and thirty-six dollars. Tom story. <laughs> oh, you had to pay for the autograph. That wasn't part of the. No, you pay for the autograph book. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> right. And the autographs are free. Well, you have to pay for your time. I'm never getting that back. But it is. Um, was it worth it? Yes. Should everyone do it all the time? A hundred percent not. If I'm doing that once every five years, that's plenty. Well, here's what I think. I think you can spend money on something like this for your family because you have such a great deal on your real estate website from Realty Ninja, which is our channel sponsor, and we appreciate them. And uh, you should check them out if you're in the real estate industry. Okay, Steve, that's I'm happy you had fun. I'm happy you're not a grouchy guy today, and you seem happy about it, and your kids enjoyed it, and your wife enjoyed it, and, and you're not – it doesn't seem like you're resenting how much money it costs you. You're acknowledging it and saying, you know what? It was worth it. So that's – it's nice for me to see you uh, – not be angry. <laughs> We're going all out, Tom. Story. We got a little Reno going on because everybody mm -hmm. is so angry at the size of my TV when they come over. So we bought a new TV. We're we're doing the whole thing here, Tom. So you got me spending money. I'm just gonna now. I'm gonna go out and get a six and a half percent mortgage and just spend more. Don't do that. Um, there was an <laughs> article that came out from CBC, <clears throat> and it was based on Stats Canada numbers. Uh, it was from 2021 and 2022. And the headline, and here's like my beef with this, right? And we talk about this a lot in this show. The headline was basically, if you're renting, you probably have a lower quality of life than a homeowner. That was the, that was the headline, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess based on the questions they asked and security and all these other things and how they feel about everything, yeah, typically across the board, renters uh, scored, I guess, lower quality of life. Um, we talk about the, the pros of own, home ownership a lot. And I know we get some flack sometime that, that like we're telling people to invest in all these things like, no, like buy your house and own it. And like, you have this pride behind it and, and it doesn't have to go up in value, but you get to pay down your mortgage and sure on paper, on paper, maybe renting is cheaper over a period of time. If you can invest in other things and like, I get all that your home is maybe a liability. It's not necessarily an asset if you're living there because you're paying all these things and all the things could happen. But if I'm a renter, <clears throat> okay, and I read this article, this got posted everywhere. Am I now telling myself, oh, it's okay, woe is me. You know, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not supposed to have as good of life quality as people that own real estate and I'm never going to get there. Like, I, it just, it's annoying to me that <clears throat> great headline, great way to get clicks. But I look at this and I'm like, all right, I don't know. It's promoting the misery. Well, that's it. But I mean, it's definitely, it, but let's, let's think about that. So I believe it was like renters report a lower quality of life than homeowners. Yeah. So it's, they're asking people who rent how they feel. Mm -hmm. And then I believe the article went on to say something about, you know, obviously older folks, 55 and up reported being even happier. And what does everybody do? That's 55 and under. Well, that's because you know, they're homeowners because they got into the market at a cheap rate. Sure. And that's why they're so happy. But I don't think that's what it is. I think that they, Security. I mean, no matter when you bought a property, it was expensive in your point of reference. Sure, it's harder now. But they have got to a point where maybe they bought at 20, 25, 30 years old, whatever that was. Let's say they bought at 30, now they're 55. So they paid off that 25-year mortgage. Mm -hmm. Of course they're happier. Yeah, they they have a sense of home ownership and pride and all that wonderful stuff, 
but they've got this weight lifted off their shoulders when they're 65 years old. They don't have rent anymore. They don't have to worry about cracking that nut every single day. Well, these are the stories you see on the news that are really upsetting to watch, where there's someone that's older, 65, and they have to leave their situation. They have nowhere to go. And it's like, it's really hard to watch. And we've, we've even had people in our comments telling us, like, I wish I had gotten in. I wish I had gotten in earlier mm. because I had a good situation up to a period of time and then it was taken away from me. I'd be curious, like, so one thing you just mentioned was when people bought the property, it, they thought it was a lot of money. Maybe we should run a poll on this channel and figure this out, but maybe just let, let, let us know in the comments as well. When you bought your last property, at the time you bought it, did you feel like you bought it at its market value? Did you feel like you got a deal on it or did you feel like you overpaid at the time? Not what it's worth now, but at the moment you bought it. What about yours, Tom? Oh, I feel like I overpaid a bit. This episode is brought to you by Realty Ninja, real estate agents. Listen up. Realty Ninja has created over 9,000 Canadian real estate websites, and they are no joke. I've been using Realty Ninja in my business since they were a small little startup in North Vancouver. Tiny, dusty little office with old leather couch and all. But look at the ninjas now. Realty Ninja is the go-to platform for real estate agents in Canada. Websites are no longer a nice to have. They are a must. Your clients expect you to feature their listings in the best light possible. They expect you to go with Realty Ninja. The backbone of my real estate business is my website. I wouldn't pick any other company to host my website other than Realty Ninja. Don't believe me? Go to my website. Check it out right now. Go to krproperties.ca and you will see that it's powered by Realty Ninja and has been for over a decade. They have all of the features I need to grow my business year after year, including lead capture, mobile-friendly design, built-in SEO, and so much more. The best part of Realty Ninja is it's totally free to sign up, no credit card is required, and you only pay when you are ready to launch your new Realty Ninja website. And no, that's not it. Sign up today at realtyninja.com slash Tom, and you will receive 20%, yes, 20% off of your entire first year when using Realty Ninja to host your real estate website. Their templates are super easy to work with yourself, or you can have the ninjas design something for you like I did. Not only is Realty Ninja the best product on the market, but it's also affordable. Listeners of this show know that I am as cheap as they come, and I've been using Realty Ninja for well over a decade now. Start your free trial today, and when you launch, save 20% using our link in the description below. And let Realty Ninja help you take your real estate business to the next level. And now, back to the podcast. Like where you are now, where you were before, like each property you've bought, do you feel like Oh, you, each each property? Yeah, There's like only at the time. Try and go back in time and go, okay, <clears throat> when I was writing this offer, was I like, thank goodness I got this place for this price? Or was I like, I'm kind of uncomfortable with this price? Um, I'd say that there's been two uncomfortable moments and then there's been three or four, like, I feel good about this. Um, mm. but the la the last uncomfortable moment, we paid 980 for a property that I lived in for four years and sold it for 1.3. But at buying it at 980, I did not feel good. Like, you know, even when I got the offer accepted, I was kind of like, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. Is this really, could I, what else could I, like you, your mind starts wondering. The place I'm in now, it's going to take some time, I think. I, I'm going to do some renos and, and increase things just based on what I can control. But this was more like I, houses on the street never come up and I wanted it. Mm -hmm. But I would say the last two, the last two main places I lived, the the day I bought them, I probably feel like maybe, personally, I feel like maybe a little bit Nothing crazy, but I, I paid a little bit more than maybe I wanted to pay. I don't know if that means that's what it was worth, but what I wanted mm -hmm. to pay. Well, the last time I bought, so that was the condo, um, I wrote an offer where I thought it was, this is before the market took off, but still early 21. Like 2020 wasn't a gangbuster year. Everybody doesn't really remember that, but 21 before the market took off. And then it was like right as the market was taking off. I remember phoning you. I remember phoning, I think, Darren. And like having these conversations, like, I think now is the time. And so I put in an offer and then next thing you know, we were competing and I happened to know the listing agent really well. 
And he phoned me back after we put in our offer. He's like, you're competing. And because we know each other so well, and he knew that I was going to get the deal done, he didn't know the other agent. He said, right. listen, we are offering it to you, but at this price. Mm. And I was like. <sighs> this was your investment property? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's too much. It's I didn't feel like it was right. How much time. higher was it in dollars than what you wanted to pay? 10 grand. 10 grand higher. Okay. I mean, it wasn't a big deal, but I guess, but back then it was that property. Um, I mean, my offer was 465 and they wanted full price, which was 475. Sure. Um, so, you know, I thank goodness we did it. I almost didn't. I almost didn't in the house we're in. For a thousand dollars, I almost didn't buy the house that we're in because I already mm -hmm. thought I was overpaying. Plus, when I bought this home, um, we negotiated the commissions out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I represented myself right. uh, in the purchase. Not something I do in the sale, but in the purchase. Um, and so I do feel like for if I, if I tossed all that back in, the home I paid uh, that I live in now, I think I paid twenty two, twenty three thousand dollars $23,000 too much for back in 2013, back when prices are less than half of what they are now. So I think people always feel uncomfortable, and that's kind of how you know. I mean, uncomfortable is when the seller doesn't want to sell for that little and the buyer doesn't want to pay that much. That's market value. Yeah, that's a good point. I, um, it's always interesting to me because in the last 12 to 18 months in our market, uh, houses are a little bit different. For a while there, they slowed down, but offer dates are still kind of popping up these days. Most of the craziness, by the way, just to address this, that you're seeing, like you're seeing the realtors post on social media, 30 offers, 40 offers on these houses. None of them mm -hmm. are in the city of Toronto. These are no. all outside. No, they're, hmm. they're, they're in Durham. They're in York. We're starting they're to see legitimate, wealth. legitimate, like multiple offers on properties that are priced where I deem market value to kind of be like mm -hmm. not underpriced. And yeah. like we saw one the other day that had 10 offers. Saw another one the other day that was maybe. And how much is it going grand. over? What, what uh, if it was listed at what you thought was market and it got 10 offers? How much is it selling over? I don't know on that one because that one was so recent, it's not done yet, it's not posted, um, not past the buyer rescission period, that sort of thing. What would but you we, deem? Sorry, go on. I was gonna say, we are seeing, um, we have seen some properties lately that are like, um, they're investors looking to invest into multi units. And my team is reporting like back to me because I haven't actually been in the properties. Like the living conditions are evident actually in these multi unit places. They're student housing now with no actual written tenancies. No, yeah, no contracts. That's it's pretty, crazy. That like happens four, or five, four or five students per, like there's three units in the house, four or five students per living unit, no tenancies. Right. It's yeah, I can't, I can't even believe it. they're probably um, selling it because they don't have any tendencies and can't collect their rent. Yeah, that's a good point. What do you think? Not what me and you or anyone in the industry believes, but what do you think the consumers believe getting a deal is on a property? Like, what are the metrics they would look at to say I got a good price? I know comparable sales and all that kind of stuff, but if we're looking at asking price, you'll see where I'm going with this. But what would you think? Twenty percent under tax assessed value. In in Toronto, that would be like fifty percent under real value because our tax assessed are still way lower. I'm evaluating a place <laughs> right now, and everything on the street has sold two hundred grand under assessed. Interesting. No, uh, and I'm also doing another evaluation in another area where everything on the street is selling two hundred grand over assessed. Well, I can tell you what I've seen is that when people tell us that they're looking for an opportunity or a deal and they have patience like okay cool that, that that gives us a good guideline to try and figure this out but most of the time it still comes back to like i don't want to pay over asking that's generally the the thing and <clears throat> there's actually a podcast listener shout out you know who you are we just helped you buy your first condo in downtown toronto and uh we he, so we paid over the asking price but i think we got the property 40 grand lower than it should have sold for why so <clears throat> this if is it the was thing. that part underpriced why didn't it so, so yeah so well because they had already tried to sell it so the price that we got it for i think was seventy five thousand dollars lower 
than the last posted price at offers any time they had. <clears throat> and sat on the market end of last year, things were quiet. They relisted and tried to go really like kind of dumb low for mm -hmm. an offer date. <clears throat> so we you bought that there. property. Sorry, excuse me. You got a little frog in your throat there. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Cough, cough it up. Cough it up. Come back with that. All right, all right. I'm better. I'm better. I'm better. Okay. okay. Um, and we we got this property. We paid over asking on paper. It will show as that this property sold mm -hmm. over asking. I think we got it for a great price. If it was listed at the at the original price and we got 20 grand off asking, that would have been paying much more than we paid in this scenario. Does yeah, that make yeah. sense? Like, yeah. so there's just so many different ways that people are gonna see it. And, and I don't know, you know, the agent on the other side if they're gonna post that they sold it over asking or whatever. <laughs> But you I know, think that's like a result of like when the market's shooting up and then shooting down, shooting up, shooting down, like it's done multiple times over the past two or three years here. It's because we can't really pinpoint value. But in my market now, I'm starting to get closer to like, okay, yeah. that product type is settling down. So now I kind of know where it's going to be within 10 or 20 grand. In February 2022, it yeah, was like I – mean. I mean, who can bring the biggest dump truck full of money, right? So it's a very um, – it's nice to get back. And it's actually showing in our pricing, if you look at the Fraser Valley Board pricing, not so much in houses but definitely in townhouses and condos. It's actually over the last six months an like, extremely flat line, hmm. which is nice because that gives both buyers and sellers certainty – of what they can expect when they go to market. So now most of the time when we're pricing, we're pricing very sharp with very small wiggle room, maybe 1% wiggle room, either up or down, right? So we're hitting where we think market value really is. If we get multiple offers, we'll probably get asking or slightly over. Or if we don't get multiple offers, we're still able to negotiate that within like a couple thousand dollars of asking. So they're pricing with certainty which i think is actually a big relief for majority of people now i agree is everybody else pricing with certainty i i think there's a lot of people that got licensed that think it's normal to underprice your home by two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. the thing that drives me insane and i think we talked about this when uh kaylee from your market was on like when people price low don't get anything on their offer date and then just leave the price low and don't readjust back yeah. to what they're at. It's like, what, who, what real estate school is teaching you this? Who is teaching you this? It's terrible. I can, advice. I can name the brokerages, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is definitely um, something we are seeing. I sold a property last year that way. It was a condo and the, I had three different agents phone me and say, listen, your price seems about right for my buyer, but what are your clients actually expecting? Because we've written asking on our last three properties and the counter coming back is $70,000 over ask. Yeah. And they've been on the market for three, four, five weeks. It's, it's a stupid marketing plan and it is not a now marketing plan. No, and it's just a way to piss off not just other agents, but the buyers are like, well, that's stupid. I'm not going to deal with that. Like that's stuff. But like underpricing didn't come from it, it it evolved, right? It didn't mm -hmm. come from like this. What happened when you were underpricing is, listen, I knew your place was worth, this is back in 2015 even, I knew your place was worth five and a quarter. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put your place at 519, make it really attractive. Right. And then they started selling for 560 and you're like, oh, it's crazy. And then so you would continuously do that. But then when that one sold for 560, the next one on the street didn't list at 519, it listed for 529. We know we're still gonna get 560 now. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, but the the list prices still kept creeping up. But it's like since the change in the market, it feels like now list prices are creeping down and down and down, and they're trying to get the prices to come up. So I don't think it's true. <laughs> sharp pricing like when the market goes up when uh when we speak with sellers and we go over different strategies and we look at the comparable sales one thing that we'll look at is what strategy did they take to achieve this outcome did they price sharp 
and sell quickly? Did they go really low and it worked out really well for them? Did they go low and it didn't work and then they priced accordingly and then sold? And we're trying to gather all this data. And it's interesting because unless there's proof that underpricing is working, it doesn't happen. Like unless you have five in a row, they're like, this strategy worked. I know not everyone's going to love this, but the only thing that the contract cares about is what you think based on our agreement with each other. What would you like to do? And you'd probably have to go back to like, I don't know, early episodes of this podcast, but people spoke out about this and said, we don't like this. We don't like that this is happening. Some people just wanted it banned. Like you can't underprice properties and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But their actions didn't say the same thing. They were People were saying this is not good, but continuously the actions of the buyers in the market were proving to sellers, this is a strategy you should probably try. For tenant landlord or homeowner insurance policies go to squareone.ca slash the tom story show use the link in the description save twenty dollars when you start your free quote right now yeah. i know the public doesn't like it but but the action the result was there in our market it's like if it's you didn't weird, underprice though. you could have left money on the table so what so like we last recorded though like this is a situation and this is a legitimate i'll use real numbers because the property sold now um, I did an evaluation on uh, a particular property, and that evaluation came out and said I should probably sell for about five thirty-five to five forty-five. So I was like, okay. And the seller was like, I don't know. There, you know, there was one listed in here way back at the peak for six ninety-nine, and I was like, sure. well, yeah, whatever. So we ended up uh, planning to come to market at five fifty-nine. So I'm like, okay, there's some wiggle room there if we don't sell immediately. Right. A week before we go to market, a piece of crap in the same complex comes up for sale at 609. And it sells in multiple offers in the 620s. <laughs> so what do I do? I could have said, you know what? Let's just stick with our strategy. But no, I was like, you know, this, yeah, this is so far off. We got to adjust. So we bring it on the market and our unit was nicer. I'm like, I don't know. This is a one off at like 630. Yeah. So we first day, one showing full price offer. Conditions sold, you know, it took some time, um, but it sold. The open house was we did the open house anyway. Um, it was very busy. But no backup offers, no nothing like that. So it ended up selling for 70, 80 grand more than I thought it would originally. Right. And guess th this is the craziest part. That was our only private showing on the property. Huh. Well, they, it was actually maybe, the buyer that missed the last one. That's what I, yeah, you, you got to before I said it, right? It was someone that knew that they wanted that building. They wanted that building, that complex. I think ours was way. I actually think when you actually compare the piece of crap, what it sold for, for the one that we sold for, buyer I did mean, okay. maybe, maybe the buyer did a fantastic job because we had a nicer unit. But like, that's another situation where you're like, in December, if I brought this thing on at 550, it probably wouldn't have sold. I bring sold. it on whatever it was, January 29th or something, and it sells for 70 grand more. It sells for, what is that? 12, 13% more? Well, we have a, uh, I mean, I'm sure you do the same thing. A lot of agents do this, but like when you meet with someone, from the day you meet with someone to the moment the property hits MLS, it could be a week, it could be a month, right? Like it mm -hmm. takes time to prepare properties. We we talk 24 hours before it's going on the market and revise our strategy mm -hmm. because I've things change so quickly. You have to. If you're sticking to what you talked about a month ago, like it could be a completely different market, good or bad. I like think totally the next change. one, so I signed one up, um, and it doesn't come on till like April something now, right. and I think we're going to likely be adjusting. Ex I don't know if we're going to adjust adjust price, um, but I think we're going to be adjusting expectations to the positive by about six figures. Is this a condo? No, no, it's a house. It's a house. Okay. No, it's a house. But it's like. <laughs> I, I saw this level in December when I did the evaluation. They're like, we're coming on April, whatever. I was like, okay, so we're going to have to reevaluate this. And I think we're going to be upwards dramatically. 
from where we were thinking. I'd be curious. You mentioned something there uh, that you had taken a conditional offer, but you still did the open house. Yeah, because I work hard, Tom. Story okay, no, me. here, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm getting at. That's not what I'm getting at. <laughs> Tom I'm story. Talk- no, no, I'm taking uh, out out of the real estate industry conversation here. Going to a pure. I'm a buyer. I don't follow this stuff. I'm out on the weekend. I see an open house. I walk in. I meet this funny looking guy named Steve and I'm like, you know what? I like this place. Steve's like, thank you for coming to the open house. We've already accepted an offer. I'd be mm-hmm. like, well, what the hell, man? Yeah. Well, what the hell? Why didn't I know that? Well, why are you here on Saturday when the property came on the market on Wednesday? <laughs> okay. But like, no, 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 no. What, we've accepted an offer. It's conditional on financing and inspection. You, and 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 documents on your system though, did it say, Soul, do you have a sold conditional on your system, or was it? You, oh, yeah, don't. that's crazy. I wish yeah, we right. had a soul. I wish we had an active. I wish we had a sold conditional. I wish we had a sold firm, and I wish we had a sold closed. Yeah, we all we have. We have sold conditional and firm. We don't have sold closed because I think the only public price that should go out is sold closed when yeah, the seller has about money this in a lot. Market. I know, yeah. I know. That's a that's a conversation for another day, probably. But I, I can remember because our market, we can change it to sold conditional, but you only change it to sold conditional when the deposit shows up. Because in Toronto, you buy a place, the deposit comes mm-hmm. within twenty four hours, right? Mm-hmm. And ours are after. <clears throat> but I can remember like years ago showing a buyer a property in St. Lawrence Market, and we go in, and they happen to be doing the open house at the same time I'm doing the showing, right? So the other agent's just there. It shows new on the system. And they really specifically wanted this place. Sorry, excuse me. Oh, man, that COVID's really kicking in. It's not time. COVID. I don't know what's going on. I could drink some water. Sure. Excuse me. And we go in and my buyer's all excited. And they're like, well, this is the one we're looking at. And we walk in and the other agent's like, yeah, we accepted an offer. I'm like, dude, like you couldn't have paged me. You couldn't have told me. You didn't change yeah. it to sole conditional in the system. Like that's a piss off. That's wasting mm-hmm. everybody's time. And mm-hmm. I get it. You as the seller, you know, the, what you'll tell me is that, well, I was trying to get a backup offer. But I, I saw a, a hardworking agent the other day. They, We actually had this one property on. It's the one I put an offer date on. Um, didn't get multiple offers. It was on the market for, I did four open houses there, three open houses there, something like right. that. So we get an accepted offer. Ends up selling for full price because it was well-priced. We get an accepted offer. We had an agent request a showing we said we appreciate that we're still showing accepted yep. offer would you still like to show she's like yeah i'd like to show it this time the inspection's going on at that time she's mm. like i don't care i would like to get in at this time we will work around the inspector so there's literally she's bringing her buyers there in case the deal falls apart because like or during when the inspection's going on so like you have some people that are willing to put in that extra work and then you have people that are like, you have an accepted offer, I'm not even interested. I think you should be showing properties with accepted offers for two reasons. One is, well, in our market, notoriously 20% of deals fall apart. So you are you could write a backup offer and you could be the first right of refusal. How common um, are backup offers for you guys? On our it's, team? It's not common here at, at I all. I know, I know it's not. And I think it should be more often. But you guys have a different thing. You guys have a higher firm up rate than we do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, how good is it for education of your buyer to get them in a property and then be like, hey, just so you know, that one we saw yesterday, it finally firmed up. The conditions, inspection, everything went through. And here's market value. Right. Because now they're more prepared as opposed to if they don't get in and see it, they don't really know. I mean, sure, they know online where market value is, but if they don't touch and feel the property and understand where you're at, it actually, it slows down the buyer's process. Yeah. I mean, like there's a period of time when we accept a conditional offer when we're waiting on the deposit that it still shows as new on the system, but any showing that comes in, we tell them, Hey, you know, it's sold conditional. We're just waiting on deposit. If you still want to show it, you can. Once we switch it to sold conditional on the system, rarely do we get showings. Yeah. Yep. Rarely. That's just because you have, yeah, I mean, do you want to, if you've got a very active buyer, do you want to show something that's got an offer on it? Probably not. But I It also depends what value. type of market it is. If there's lots to I look actually, at. When I, was, um, when I was a buyer's agent myself, the first time I took a buyer out, I would always try and book something that had an accepted offer because I want to show, to show the market them. value. 
That's a good right? point. I don't. Actually. There's no guessing. There's no yeah. like, hey, what what do you think this place is really worth? We're gonna know what this one is worth, so we can better judge those next ones. Or maybe you like it, and we can write a backup offer. But a lot of agents don't like to write backup. A lot of agents don't like to write subject to sale. I love to do it all. Steve, I have some good news for you. Are you ready? Next year's next year's Disney trip is free. <laughs> Paid for by the Tom Story Show revenue, which we are profitable now, Tom Story. I cut you a check the other day. We are profitable. We're making big bucks over here. Um, more important than that, inflation's under 3% again. Mm-hmm. It's at 2.9 for January. Okay. This is obviously encouraging based on what the December numbers where we where we jumped up a little bit. Does this change anything in your opinion on how this year plays out? I think we are going to see less rate cuts than. All I still of think we're going to get three. I still think we're getting three. All three twenty-five hundred. You can't thought we were. I don't think we are. I still don't think we're going to get more than well, two max. CIBC still thinks in twenty twenty-four. I know, but just they st- still think we're getting one point two five percent total cuts this year. Yeah, what is which CIBC? would take us down to three. <laughs> Take us down. Well, all the banks are making projections that are usually wrong, but they're yeah. still coming out with that strong at this moment in time. So they think between now, they think the economy is going to get so bad between now and the end of the year that they're going to cut to 3.75%. That's what they're it. saying. I think CIBC stinks. I don't think you guys are given the right uh i mean maybe i guess that's a fun prediction i guess but like how do you then quantify that i'm sitting here going okay well when are they going to cut remember when we did that with nolan like, I th- when are they going to cut i think i know i i'm sticking by what i said at the beginning i think there's still going to be a not necessarily I'm, i'll say what i said at the beginning i think june july and then there'll be one is it an october date i think those are my three predictions on 25 pointers but I think a lot think, of people now are thinking July is going to be the earliest it could happen. I, I don't know. Is anybody, did anyone think it was going to happen before the summer? I guess people yeah. did. I didn't think so. People thought April. Who thought, thought that? April. But based on what? Hmm, I don't know. But I guess it would have to get. That. Here's the thing, though. Like when you always have that that idea of how close do we have to stick to the Fed in the States. And let right. me tell you, being there last week. There was, it's not the same thing, man. Down there, and now I was at a vacation spot, so for sure. Um, but it was ungodly amounts of people not, like they couldn't wait to part with their money. Because well, they, they have a 30-year mortgage at 2%, Steve. Uh, it's not impacting them the same way it is here. That could be true. That it could be true. true for a lot of them. It was jammed, and their economy, I don't think, and I think the numbers are showing that, their economy is way stronger than ours right now, and their house prices have come down, and their interest rates have gone up. So like, how far do we sway off of that? I, I We do not need to stay, contrary to popular belief, I don't think we need to stay very super close to them. I think we can come down. But like you say, the the housing is almost all of our inflation right now. If we well, took in housing out, what would it be? We'd well, be here's here's how the numbers break recession. down. So of the of the inflation at two point nine percent, fifty nine percent of it has to do in some capacity with housing. Mortgage interest was still up twenty seven percent. Like, of course it is because you've raised the rates. Electricity eleven percent, then followed by. Rental costs, home insurance, and property taxes. Those five things combined were 59% mm. of the inflation. I mean, even when they cut everything, I would still like to see the overnight rate at 4%. This year or just in general? And for I think, I think they'll get back to three, three and a half at some point. Yeah, they're predicting that they need to yeah. be, at, if inflation is at 2%, then there's no need to be uh the your apparently there's no need for your overnight rate to be above 2.75 or to three and a quarter <sighs> i don't know i like, still think yeah i don't know rates rates are going to come 
there's going to be a rate cut this year. I'm I'm pretty certain of that. Pretty certain of that. I think they're going to hold off as long as they possibly can. Probably, but there will be a cut this year. So In isn't t- it funny how they they wait for everything too long? Well, like two years ago, far. when you were like, "Can you start turning this thing up, please?" Well, that's the thing. They waited too long to start raising the rates, and madness ensued. And, and they just missed it too, eh? Because the February month was so silly. They uh, just missed it. If they had done it in January, they could have poured a little bit maybe. of water on the fire, maybe. but uh, a little bit. They threw gasoline bit. on it. They should have been cranking them up a year before they did slowly. But uh, one and a quarter, man. That is five cuts or half point cuts three you know a quarter and then two halves you would have to have a very very bad economy and i don't think we are there and even the layoffs that we're seeing a lot all of the, it is hey all the media layoffs eh? like you see how mad trudeau was about he was fuming about Good. what uh you know what that's gonna do everybody hates trudeau so they're just gonna be more on board with bell so screw you trudeau um that's here's the thing though you have an archaic system and isn't it funny that he brings in these bills that are like, oh, we're going to save the media. And everybody's like, you realize this is going to crush the media, right? And then the media gets crushed Makes and they lay it. off people. And they're like, oh, this is a garbage decision. What was his quote? Garbage decision? They said garbage decision, yeah. But like, what are they supposed to do? I actually was – when you look further into it, Bell Media, the, the media side of thing, is they're losing money left, right, and center. Hmm. There, nobody is using that anymore. The Bell makes all of their money off the mobility side of the business and the telecommunication side of the business. So they're like, wait a minute, this is a lost leader. Of course we're getting rid of it. Yeah. I don't know. Just nobody uses that. I think there's obviously a, a massive amount of distrust in regular mainstream media now. So it's becoming antiquated and... I I don't I I don't begrudge any company that's going to try and increase their profits and and lay people off because I don't think that they value I definitely didn't value those. Do you watch CTV News? Well, you're on CTV News. <laughs> I, I go on CTV. <laughs> but like yes, or, I is do, that even Steven. one of them? Is it global? Is it CTV? Like I don't even I, know who Bell I go owned. I yeah, CTV is one of them. I go on CTV and CP24, which is Bell owned. Yeah. Um, but think like I don't think that that many people are finding they might have it on but i don't think they have value in it like they did before well one of the most interesting things and we talked to this on the phone before you left i was recommending this video on my youtube feed and i and i rarely really truthfully watch political stuff like i don't really get into it but it was uh andrew shears like doing youtube videos now have you seen this and they're they're very well edited and yeah. then by no means am i turning this conversation to the conservative political hour because both of us have opinions on both sides. And I, it's not hard set either way. I think that's fair to say. Steve's maybe leaning a further direction than I am, but I think people will be surprised if they actually knew what we both were. But anyways, he was he was um, he was talking to I th- maybe the CEO of CBC or whoever it was, the president of CBC or something, and they had given out a bunch of huge raises, and he was basically saying like, you know, what, why, why did you do this? Your numbers were down, everything was down, and you know, politicians don't answer questions, right? They just walk around mm-hmm. questions. They don't actually answer mm-hmm. it. But her her basic response was like, well, the numbers that you're showing for a 30% decrease in revenue or viewership was because it was a non-Olympic year, yeah. um, which is fair. Like that makes sense. But then his response was like, okay, so what we know is that in a non-Olympic year where we don't have an event that brings the world together, you don't have good enough programming yeah. for the average Canadian to watch anything else on there. And I'm That's not... Cool. Like there's some Shits Creek started on CBC. That show went wild, but it was mostly because it ended up on Netflix in the States and it found the second life. There's been great things like Hockey Night in Canada was my childhood. So I'm not saying anything negative. It's just like there was a lot of money given out to people at the top in a government funded organization Mm -hmm. that in every metric that could be tracked was decreasing. Mm -hmm. And I think for Canadians, regardless of where you stand on the political side, you should say like, well, does that seem right? But I think the, like, I'm actually a big, I think the CBC is actually a very good thing, um, which goes against a lot of the political beliefs maybe that I have as well. But I think the CBC is a great thing because I do think you need to give 
um, voices or perspective to people that live in the small towns, which they wouldn't get with a big. But that's what Trudeau was saying: is like this is cutting all the local news out, and the local news creates, you know. But is the CBC spending their time on that as well, or are they trying to? jam crap programming down our throat like what is it I, I don't even know what's on those channels anymore murdoch mysteries like what i don't know i can't say anything about the shows because i've never seen them i don't exactly watch exactly my point nobody cares i watch so youtube man <laughs> yeah exactly. and the streaming where, apps that's yeah. where the real information is right tom oh there we go oh yeah um all right i have some insider information oh and i actually did some pretty a big homework on this. And I was a little bit scared to post this on my Instagram because I didn't want to start an absolute um, comment section, people riled up. And this is mostly just a real estate industry thing, but I wanted to bring this up. So someone had sent to me, they're a listener of the show, they're probably listening to this, they had sent to me a breakdown and it was it took from all of 2023, it took the top 1,000 real estate agents in the city of Toronto and ranked them based on dollar volume production, total sold. So you sell a house for a million dollars, that counts as $1 million to your dollar volume production, right? Okay. So I was just curious. There's a lot of noise out there. We run polls and we ask people what you look for in real estate agents and brand is never considered, like in the polls that we run, Mm -hmm. rarely. So I'm like, okay, I'm curious, how many of the top 1,000 agents work for the big brands? versus the smaller brands versus the brands that are making the most amount of noise and they're growing the fastest, but are they growing the fastest in numbers? Or are they growing the fastest in production? And the wildest stat out of all this is the, the agent that was number 1000 on this list. And this is just city of Toronto. This is not GTA. This is not, this is, if you pay double land transfer tax, when you bought your home, you bought with an agent in the city of Toronto. Okay. Number 1000 agent to get to that spot, They did about $5 million in sales volume. This episode of the Tom Story Show is sponsored by Carish Real Properties. Here's the deal. If you're moving to Fraser Value, oh my God. Here's the deal. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's see if you can at least get this right, Tom, because you've screwed it up so many times before. Say it with me. Fraser. 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 Valley. Fraser. Okay. Pick it up from there. Fraser Valley. Fraser Valley. Fraser. No, no, Fraser, Fraser Valley. Rick just Razor. say Surrey. Surrey. If you're moving to Surrey, there's one person that you need to call, and it just so happens to be my podcast co-host. Now, I am. I make lots of jokes, you know, at Steve's expense during the podcast. But but the reality is, if I was moving to Surrey or the surrounding areas, I would call him because they're really damn good at what they do. They understand the market. And I know whether you're buying tomorrow or you're gonna buy in two years, they will be with you until the end of the transaction. They know what they're talking about, they have experience. Even though Steve looks old, he's not actually that old, so he's still kinda of hip, right? He's, he still kinda of knows what's going on, but I have personally referred my clients when they're moving out there to Steve and his team, and they've always done an amazing job and rolled out the red carpet for them. Now, Steve, I know it's weird that you're even here as I'm doing this ad read, but if someone were to be moving to your area, how could they connect with you? Uh, super simple. You can go into the show notes, uh, book a call with me right now using the link in the description of this show. Uh, pick a time that works best for you. Set up a call, either a buyer consultation, a seller consultation, or Tom Story's line. If you just want to have a chat about real estate, you can do that too using the link in the description below. Yeah. And I know uh, from personal experience with my clients, you know, connecting with Steve is that it's it's a no pressure situation. You're just going to be educated. And when you're ready to make that decision, they'll be there to guide you through it. Also, if you are a real estate agent that listens to our show and you have clients moving out to the West Coast of Canada, connect with Steve first and see if they can be of assistance. You can go into the first link in the description and book that call with Steve directly as well. Thank you. And now back to the show. Wait, Tom, you forgot one thing. This communication is not intended to cause or induce breach of any agency agreement. Existing agency agreement? I think I got it right. So five homes at a million bucks or 10 homes at 500,000. Not a lot, right? So, so that on its own is kind of interesting data. But I was like, I'm curious. And I'm just going to read you the top five. If people are interested in this, I can share more about it. Will this, get me, this won't get me in trouble. 
<laughs> I mean, we're about to find out. No, it won't. So no, it won't. this is data. Every, every, anyone that's a broker has access to this. So oh, okay. this is 2023. All, all of our listeners are brokers. <laughs> A uh, broker of records have access to this backend software that can pull these numbers. Anyways, okay. the reason why you'll you'll see why I'm I'm saying this. In the top 1,000 agents, 239 of them on that list, so over 25 percent. Can you guess what brand they were associated with? They were Remax agents. Yes. Next, Royal Page. I don't know what the number is, but next, Royal Page. Uh huh. Royal Page was number two at 163. Okay. Home life was number, but then here's the drop off. That's interesting. Home life was number three on these numbers, and this is how many agents they have in the top one thousand. Okay, this is home life had forty four. Keller Williams had forty three. Sage Real Estate shout out to Sage because they're a smaller brokerage with not big numbers, but they have producers. They had thirty five. Then Chestnut Park. Then Century Twenty One. Anyways, you can go all the way down the list. And then I thought to myself, okay, this is not anything that I wasn't kind of expecting. As someone that trades in this market, I see all these people. What about the top 100? What about just the top 100 agents in Toronto? What brands do they work for? And this is where it was kind of interesting to me. There are four brands that represent 60% of the top 100 agents in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I believe they're the same ones, right? No, actually. Two are different. Oh, you're you're gonna have two probably high end uh -huh. boutique boutiques. So you're gonna have Royal Page and and Remax, and then you're gonna have two high end boutique -y type of which I wouldn't even know their names probably. Chestnut Who's, Park and Sotheby's were the were the other two in uh, Sotheby's in uh, the top four. In and now keep in mind this is interesting. But isn't that interesting? 60% yeah. of the top 100 agents in the city of Toronto work for four brands, and they are all whether we like this term or not, legacy real estate companies. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of online brokerages that are doing well in this list. They're just further down because obviously they're newer. They, they're growing. They're not, they don't have, Royal Page has been around for 100 years. Remax is, I don't know, since the 70s, I, w I would assume. Um, but it's interesting. And, and the reason I bring this up in the podcast is I know we have agents that listen and this wouldn't really be surprising to them. But for a consumer... Because we've been asking you guys, do you even care who your realtor works with? And typically the answer is no. But it is interesting to see that people, and it doesn't mean because you do the most amount of business that you're the best option for you. That's not what I'm saying. But the numbers are the numbers. And I haven't heard anyone actually break it down like this before. And I, saw, I thought this was pretty interesting. Do you think if you did that, that for your market, it would be similar in terms of not not the specific oh, yeah. brands but uh, percentage wise who's kind of doing actually all the business oh we actually get that so one of the things our broker does in the monthly meeting is show with like the local brokerages around us who's got what market share and so we actually do get to see those and I mean, thankfully, we're growing, but yeah, it's the same guys every single time. I'm actually thinking that some of those particularly maybe even Remax is is shrinking now. It seems to be the old guard where we are. Like when I was coming up uh, a while back, home life was huge compared to what it is now. They're, they're still pretty big in our market. They're, they're here, but they're not what they were. And I do feel like Remax is fading. I feel like Royal Page is even still coming up. Um, well, you don't have to say that just because I work there. You can... No, is they're it in your market is what you're what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Royal right. Page is getting bigger, I think. Um, they've taken over some brokerages and things like that. So I don't know. It's it's always shifting. Um the disruptors are there. I don't know if they're really disruptors or not. I think a lot Well, they of haven't yet disrupted sales bad. volume. Yeah. Um I just think I'm, they're gonna be fads. The online, the newer stuff, I just I just really do. I just, I, I, there's nothing there that shows staying power to me. It, 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 right now it shows this is the new thing. And there's obviously most of those uh, models come with some sort of other revenue for the agent. Sure. And that's why I think they're going there. I don't think that those online brokerages would have uptake with agents if they didn't offer the, the second stream of revenue. 
There was like a miniature uh, war that broke out online based on a comment that was made at a real estate conference. Uh, and we're going to leave all the names out of this, but everyone knows what happened. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, man, people are passionate about these things. So uh, I'm a numbers person. I make sense of the world based on numbers. And, and that's why I was like, okay, I acknowledge all this. There's growth. And maybe, Steve, five years ago, these numbers were even stronger for Royal Page and Remax, and they have shrunk mm -hmm. because they've lost agents to these other brands. But mm -hmm. still, as of right now, they hold the most productive agents in the market. So I was talking that's, to a managing a broker outside of my brokerage, um, and he was saying that he loses three agents on average per month to an online brokerage. And he says one out of three comes back within three months. But you still lost two agents. Yeah, yeah. He still has to recruit. I mean, I don't know what the regular turnover is anyway, but he's like, right. be, and it's probably because these guys aren't doing as much. So they want to go to a super low fee brokerage. Probably. Yeah, it makes sense too. Yeah. But he says a third of them within two or three months are like, there's zero support over there. I'm coming back. So. Well, we have to have someone on to rebut that. We've had Brad McCallum on the show, who's one of my favorites, but uh, we didn't really get into the brokerage talk on that episode. That was just about why Calgary is still selling for so much money and it's just rising up there. By the way, I didn't realize in our last episode, was I the only person in Canada not aware that Winnipeg had, had the most, mos it's like the mosquito capital of Canada? <laughs> never, I didn't know. I've Did you know been, that? I've, been, I've, I've only heard that you- I've never won. heard that. You, if you park outside, you run from your front door to your – like at certain months of the year. Just wear one of those nets. The mosquitoes chew your ankles like dogs. That's what I've been told. <laughs> I didn't know that at all. Um, okay. I want to wrap this up in a way that is just thrilling for the viewers, okay? So we're talking about something – going to um, take your shirt off, Burt Kreischer style? No, I'm not. We're going to talk about Steve's – do you want to talk about your mortgage or you want to save this? Because I have a story I could talk about parking. I you think want I want to rant. talk. Let's do your parking because I think I'm going to save that story. So what I did, we'll tease it for a future catch up episode and maybe okay. keep it there. But what I wanted to do is a little bit relating to what we talked about at the beginning, which is the expense of my vacation and how I notoriously don't go on vacations. I was actually in a, a sales center one time for like a timeshare. And the guy's like, let's talk about how much you spend on vacation. He's trying to tell me why the timeshare <laughs> was better. And it was basically like... <laughs> I go on a four thousand dollar vacation once every five years, and he just he stopped. He's like, I give up. <laughs> but what I wanted to do is, I wanted to show, and I've actually crunched the numbers about what I bought my home for and how much I've used that money that most people do spend on vacations, probably, and other things like car payments, which I don't have, and then how I've done that to pay down my mortgage faster and where my balance is today versus where it would have been mm. should I have not done any prepayments and I've got all that math done but yeah I um, think that will be that like anytime. a that'll be like a 10 15 minute segment so let's let's yeah, save yeah. that because I think that'll be interesting um Steve I'm in my 30s now and I've realized as I've as I've gotten a little bit older, my back's hurting and things like that but I'm also just getting a little bit grouchier uh I've, you've been rubbing off on me a little bit and uh, so Monday earlier this week, this episode is basically coming out the day or two after we record it. Monday earlier this week, um, it was family day. We all had the Monday off, right? It was nice. We spend time. Now, one of the great things about these stat holidays uh, in, is it called family day for you guys in BC? Is that a Canada thing? Is that everything? Uh, it's not a Canada thing, but we do have it, okay. and it's now on the same day as Ontario. Okay. When they first brought it out, we were on a different day than Ontario. Okay. For All right. Anyways, um, one of the great things about these stat holidays is that you can park anywhere in Toronto, and you don't have to pay for parking in the paid parking areas because it's a holiday. People aren't working, and it's like whatever, right? <laughs> Now, we all knew how much money from federal government came down into the economy given to people through the pandemic. We can all say people are lazy now. They don't want to go back to work. We can do all these things, okay? But what we, but what we do know is at some point, they're going to have to scrape some of this money back. They're going to get it back, okay? Yeah. Now, they've already raised our taxes 9.5%. That is official for the city of Toronto. So there you go. There's that. Steve. More comments on that too. But I know. Well, let's save that. Let's save that. Um, on Monday, family day, as a family, my parents, my wife, my sister, my kid went out for dinner in downtown Toronto. Okay, and I was I was aware that this was coming, but you can no longer park for free 
on stat holidays in the city of Toronto. And so I went to the city of Toronto's website. I went, okay, you know what? I'm not just going to be an old grouchy person about this like Steve. I'm going to do my research and I'm going to find what, what, what was the reasoning behind this. And it said on the website, the reason we're doing this is because we have to mitigate or something along the lines of like the increased demand for parking in the city of Toronto. So I took up my phone. I parked my car. I paid for parking, which by the way was $20 for three hours. Ridiculous. From the city or from? From Green P, which private. no, Green P is the city. And Green P. Ooh, it was sounds, also like super downtown. Like, it was like it was like in the middle funny of the because our parking here smells like Green P. <laughs> <laughs> but Anyways. so I park my car. I see two other people that are parked on the other side of the road, a parking guy giving them tickets. They weren't at their car or would have like told them, like, watch what's going on. They both come out, they look at it, like, and they're both like, What the hell? Like they had no idea this had changed. They start, they put this into effect on family day. Mm-hmm. It's like, hope you have a great family day. Also, if you go out and try to have dinner with your family and, you know, help our economy and our restaurants and things like that, you're going to have to pay for your parking today. Steve, I took out my phone and I said, hey, I'm downtown. I'm in the middle of the city. There's increased demand for parking. I just had to pay for parking on a sad holiday. I just want to show you how many people are parking. And I was in the middle of downtown, the most crowded area you could have been in. It was empty around me. Nobody else was parking. And then the next thought is, well, if they're not going to park on these side streets close to things, what they're then going to do is going to try find one hour free parking on, on streets with houses and take away parking. So... I'm not sure really what my end goal of this of this conversation was, but I'm just a little bit frustrated. I feel like we're just we're just getting just just grabbed at from every direction. Of course, and of twenty course. bucks makes no difference for my life to take my family up. For, it doesn't matter, but it's not the point. It for sure is the point, but yeah, it is it is a claw on everything. I mean, I think it's funny your guys' tax went. Uh, to nine point five percent, and two year year ago, two years ago, Surrey's went to twelve point five. Uh, our increase, our property taxes went up twelve point five, down from the proposed seventeen point five. Uh, wow. But anyway, it's 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 not going to stop. I saw an article this morning talking about the clawback of the CERB for everybody. Right? There's guys that are not making sixty thousand dollars a year that now owe. Mm-hmm. to the government to claw back, which money they never should have given out in the first place, but that's a different thing. But guess what they're going to do? Do you know, actually I looked at this because I was wondering for my own tax reasons. Do you know what the, um, I guess it's the, I guess it's the CRA charges for interest. (laughs) No, I don't. What? I'm sure it's not pretty. Uh, Right now it's between eight and a half and 10 and a half percent. Oh my God. They're like a so, private lender. <laughs> they are the biggest of private lenders. They are the <laughs> and yeah, so all these people are going to get hooped and the taxes are only going up because apparently we need more taxes because Justin Trudeau just came out here yesterday or day before, gave apparently $2 billion to fund housing, uh, government built housing, which I'm not a big fan of. Um, yeah, it's. The spending doesn't seem to stop for the government. They don't seem to understand that the more you spend, the worse it's going to get. And they have to do things like parking on holidays, on weekends. Are they doing weekends now too? Oh, weekends were always a thing, man. <laughs> okay, so it was just holidays were off before. It, it's Sunday, Sundays. I think this was a church thing. It was like Sundays parking is free until 1 p.m. I believe that's still a thing. Because mm-hmm. people that went to church were complained that I shouldn't get a ticket if I, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe that's still in place for Toronto. Sundays you're good till one, but uh, after that you're paying for parking. And Saturdays, a hundred percent, you're paying for parking. You know what's actually really crazy is pay parking at hospitals. Well, I mean, it's that's very normal in Toronto. It's very, I know it's expensive it's here now too, but it's yeah. it's not right. Um, I know. Tax. Let's tax more and see how that goes. That was fun. Always enjoy a good catch up episode. Um, Steve had a good vacation. We're happy for him. He spent 15 grand. Okay. Wow. Wow. 
$15,436. Inflation's moving in what looks like a good direction, and there's likely going to be a rate cut at some point this year. When? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. The big banks think they're going to be way more aggressive than me and Steve think they're going to be, but who the hell knows what's happening? We didn't really even, which we should have, talked about the market in this episode, but like... February numbers are going to be stronger than January in Toronto. It's been a very solid month so far. Things are moving. Things are happening. Not everything, but, you know, even I listed a condo the other day. I got two offers on it in three days and sold for asking price. And, you know, it certainly wasn't like that. Listed another one the other way. I've had five showings in the first three days. Activity is starting to show up. I don't think it's going to be there in prices quite yet for condos, but houses are, are back. They're selling. There's Next something. week, let's start off with the conversation of if we do come down 1.25%. What would it mean for the market? What does that do to the market right now? Okay, I'll put it in my That notes. is cliffhanger till next week. <sighs> same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you've made it this far and have not already, make sure to throw this video a like, subscribe to our channel if you're driving in your car. Well, I hope I hope you have another podcast you can listen to after this. So I hope you're close to your destination. Thank you for Realty Ninja for sponsoring this episode. And Steve, final words, please. Uh, I only put on three pounds. Hey. <laughs> Four corn dogs. Four corn dogs I had while I was there. They were cool. Four corn dogs equals three pounds. I know. I also had much other a lot of other stuff but okay we'll wrap it there thanks everyone for watching thanks for listening and we'll see you next week bye 30,